Card Games TV One podcast. Uh, the, the, the the journey of my card game journey. Current state of card game journey. Uh, at some point, I won't be you know making much you know decks and whatnot. So when it comes to Dragon Ball Super, because eventually, you know, I'll get to my final form, as they say. And I've been alluding to that for a while. My final form. There's not much uh, left to do in the game, per se. You know, other than obviously just playing the game, right? You know, play competitively. That kind of stuff, so. I mean, I got tons of deck profiles, right? Tons of decks that I'm toying with. But I'm trying to um, wither, wither them down to, you know, just to select a few um, decks that I'll, you know, be using and playing and wither, the, you know, wither down the strategies. You because know, it's like, Infinite possibilities when it comes to uh, playing the game, right? To winning, so many different things you can do. As you can, see, if you're watching the video version of this, you know, bringing back good old chain, you know, chain attack trucks and Zeno, the playing god combo, using that as a winning con, along with other cards. You know, like over Rome, for example, so that you can get an extra body on board. Uh, you know, Napa, for example, Super Combo to get extra bodies on board. Another thing I want to do is make sure that I have more than one target for Chain of Tanks Trunks, so I'm just not only using Trunks just for Zeno. So I also got Haru Haru and Fearless Pan and this uh, Goku deck. This is set one Goku. Yeah, set one Goku. Green Goku with a double strike. So, just trying to bring back some old strategy. Using Chain Attack Trunks to bring out Haru Haru against a green or, or yellow leader. So I can restand all four energy. Then use that four energy to play some other stuff. Like, for example, Fearless Pan. Uh, because she'll give a uh, double strike to a. Uh, Trunks plus a 5k boost, so Trunks will be a 25k uh, double strike. If I have body or electric in play, he, electric will be a 20k double strike. Plus the lead, and the lead I'm using already has double strikes on. That there alone, right there, is 7 potential, well, 8 potential damage because you know how I was in play. So 8 potential damage just with those cards alone. That's not including the fact that I can run Waking Boy Water for an extra. You know, double strike. So that would be two, four, six, eight, ten potential damage. If I got my uh, pan, uh, time patrol maiden, right, that would bring me up to eleven potential damage, right? And then if I have Napa, I'm gonna bring me up to uh, eleven. Let me see, right? Two, six, eight. 10, 11, 12, 12, 12 potential damage. Um, and ironically, in that strategy, I will have energy for for a Saint Scion, so I can use the Saint Scion um, before I play the pan, right? To bring out the two uh, pan, uh, pan skillers, and that'd be an extra 4 damage on top of, top of everything else. So I already said 12 plus 4, that's 16. That's potential 16 damage off of having one, two, three, four, five, six cards. Seven if I add the uh, eight if I add. All right, so eight cards. So we need eight specific cards from the deck, one copy of each, right, in order to pull off. I don't that counter. Let's see two. Six, 
13, 14. Fifteen, sixteen, because I get those right. Sixteen, yep, sixteen. Potential damage off of eight cards. Technically, could probably do seventeen if I attack with Saint Science first before I do the minus ability. So I could potentially push it up to seventeen potential damage on turn four. That kind of stuff. So just trying to bring back some, some old school strategies. <laughs> anyway, I always say you know the first four damage is the easiest thing, so it requires a little effort. The last two is the hardest, and I've been consistently capable of doing um, seven damage, even when I went to my locals. Um, besides the you know obviously the games where I uh, you know where I won. The 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 get you know the games that I I lost my opponent was was either at one or two like typically one ironically right typically one it might have been like just two opponents where I got them down to two at most but other than that most of my opponents always got down to one so um. So, but the goal, right, my final form is to be able to do, obviously, 8 damage consistently, as opposed to 7 damage consistently, right? For those who follow me, watch a lot of my videos, right? Watch a lot of my older gameplays. Are familiar with, you know, me being able, I mean, there was a time where consistently I could do 4 or 5, so people can do 4 or 5. Obviously, because I always say the first word is the easiest, so doing 4 or 5 damage is not too difficult. But over time, you know, got up to six, then got up to seven, which to me, you know, is a personal goal right there. Is like for some people, you know, winning the whole entire game right, is, you know, the ultimate goal. It's like that, that's fine, nothing wrong with that. But you know, the thing is, is that for people to do eight damage, right? They're putting a lot of effort, a bunch of stuff, just to try to just to try to do eight damage to your opponent. A lot of times you're looking for decks that can easily facilitate that. That's why a lot of people's W's came from like Cell Zen more than from, you know, skillful gameplay. All they did was get their point, just do at least four damage, right? And then wait, maybe not even do any damage at all, just wait until the right time to do some type of play where they may be, uh, and this is, you know, a, a strategy that we're bringing back, right? Do the soul chain, drop your points hand size down to three, right? Then drop, um, because you probably already have Charis Matter and Freeze already in play when you do that, right? So now you have a five and seven, that's 12 altogether. And then drop soul Zeno, rip your opponent's hand, and just deal your opponent, you know, eight damage back to back, right? Because you, you got quadruple strike. Dual attack, so you can attack twice, so that's eight damage off of so most people's W's was just that. I've seen people lose because they didn't draw their cells in, but sh shown that cells in was their only win call, it was the only way they were going to win. Even though, ironically, they had cards in their deck that if they used it right, they could have won with those cards. I've won with just three, uh, bar Prime, six energy. Just swing with the leader, pay two, combo, right? Man. War cry his field, I draw a crack. Swing with the war cry, right? Combo another war cry from my hand to power up my the war cry I have in the field, so it's a 30k double strike. Bang, double strike, right? The deal the damage goes through. Bang. The other one, second one hits the field, I draw a card, right? Swing with it. Combo the third one, you know what I mean? 30k double strike again. You know what I mean? My opponent needs at least two combo. That's two super combos per each of my you know, 30k attacks, right? That's if I'm not combo. I could combo 5k and make it even harder, right? Because then my opponent's going to need more than uh, two super combos to try to out combo my attack. Right? So I need 25k combo power um, for each of my uh, Wake and War Bar swings, 
Remember, I'm drawing a card every time I play them, so I'm pretty much guaranteed to be able to uh, give up five five k each. And if I draw super combos, right, even crazy, right? If I draw super combos back, just throw them in there, right? So it's not too hard to get their attacks really high to greatly increase the chances of their attacks going through. And I've won, you know, many of times just doing that that line of play. I've even made decks where that was the the win card, was just playing playing that. Playing, you know, obviously Morgan to have the pricing hands. Playing uh, Planet Vegeta to add extra copies and just, you know, stall long enough to have enough energy to play them, play out that combo. Anyway, uh, of course I've done you know stuff where uh, I've attacked with everything I have on my board. My point is like, all right, I survive. I got one life left. And then, but their hand size is low, and they're and I'm tapped out on this down too. So it looks like I'm gonna end my turn. And then I'm like, bang, wake, wake and warrior barter over round twenty k double strike for game, you know, type of deal. So on that, I've done some other. I played some other cards where it's just I play the card and it itself is a win con, right? So I've done stuff like that. But anyway, like I said, is you know just. Attacking with a leader, unison, maybe even throwing a chomper here and there. Playing a couple free plays like Napa Super Combo by Garlic, stuff like that. Um, using same Scion to, you know, to aggro my opponent the first two turns of the game. Things of that nature. The more I understand the game, the less good I have to be. Uh, so I've mastered the art of not being good at the game. That makes sense. Right? So it's not too different from the concept. That's why I call it like, you know, Ultra Instinct. The idea of, you know, autonomous, you know, whatever they, you know, term, how they describe Ultra Instinct, you know, it's basically your body, you know, moves on its own, right? So since I'm trying not hard, I'm not trying hard to, you know, do a lot of damage and do a lot of fancy stuff to uh, deal my opponent damage, obviously, that's me using less skill, right? Less thinking, especially if I'm not comboing, because that's the main thing. It's me uh, playing cards deliberately that uh, makes it where I don't have to combo. If anyone has to combo, it's my opponent, not me. So I play cards that forces my opponent to have to combo, because if they don't combo, they'll take hits. If they don't hate, they'll take hits. If they don't block, they'll take hits. You get it? So always playing stuff that's at least 20k and above, or at least 15k, I always think of my opponent having a, their leader on the awakened side when I play. So I don't think of their leader as a 10k leader. When the game starts, I think of their leader mainly as a 15k. Even if I'm going to be swinging at my opponent with a whole bunch of 10k's turn one, I'm always with the mindset that you know my opponent will be 15k at some point in the game sooner than later. And, you know, I have to make sure that my attacks you know, can can land. I got to make sure that my attacks, at least at base, is 15. But 20 would be better because that forces my opponent to have to use super combos or 10Ks to try to out combo my attack. So I take that to account. The fact that my opponents will have super combos more often than me, right? Then I need to make sure that my attacks are at least strong enough that forces them to have to use their super combos. And ideally, I want them to use it. Uh, early to mid game. That way, they don't have them late game. So that will go. I'm trying to go for game through attacking. I don't want super combos to pop out, pop out of my over, right? And potentially save my opponent from losing just because they you know, just so happen to have the super combo. Just because they were capable of getting their attacks high enough to stop my attacks from going through. So the idea is to make sure your attacks go through. Um, obviously, progressively, you want your attacks to get stronger over time anyway. You can start the game off with a couple 10Ks, 15Ks, but eventually you want to get to 20, 25, 30, right? 40K, ideally. You want to get to some higher numbers, you know, by the time you go to late game, because you don't want to be late game swinging with a 15K, right? Or a 10K, and your opponent can just easily out combo with a 5K combo power, super combo. So that's the kind of stuff you have to you know, think about. You know, I do. So I try to come up with find cards that I can play that have high attacks that I could easily cheat them out. 
like over them obviously things like our electric you know those many options let's go on or at least have something strong that i could play early game they'll stick on the field for them. like a 15k unison or 20k unison right like like the the jiren um unison that's in this list you know <clears throat> i could play for three red energy right it's a 20k body you know it's not a battle card so it's immune to a lot of cards which is always great that I could plus one to give it double strike, and of course, plusing it for markers, right? It's gonna keep it on the field long, right? Even if my opponent's double striking this thing, it'll, st it'll still be on the field for at least two turns at most, right? <laughs> um, and it'll put in work because I mean, the turn in which I play it, I'll get to swing with it 20k double strike, and then if my opponent even hits it back with double strike, that's fine. I'm still here, I still got two markers left on it, and I can swing at least one more time. On the following turn, right? So, you at least get potentially four damage off this card by itself. Very little effort, right? Because I just gotta play it and use it. And since it does, it's not a battle card. I don't have to worry about stuff like gas and trunks or anything of that nature stopping me from playing it and using it. Right? Then it has the auto and the minus three ability that I can take advantage of, you know, for defensive purposes. That's a factor to take into account. So again, like I said, sometimes even just playing certain cards just makes, you know, the damage dealing process so much easier. And I'm always focused on damage output. Um, a lot of players, for many years now, <laughs> have always been focused on many other things. But you hear stuff about the meta, and you hear stuff about, like, it's like, you gotta have this card for this, uh, for, for, for when somebody plays Cell, you know, for, for Cell. You need this card for when somebody plays Black Mass Sand, or this and that, or you should play back to my saying we play against this deck and this deck. Like you hear a lot of that stuff about you know, side deck cards and card floodgate like cards, like just cards to help you beat certain card effects and strategies. Like the fact that some people literally have cards that they want to use specifically when somebody plays Topo. My strategy against Topo is just like, all right, I'm not going to attack. <laughs> well, your turn. Oh, you try to attack me? Okay, let me drop my Topo. That's my strategy. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, like I make, I try to make things simple. It's like I'm not gonna waste time trying to counter your counter, right? I'm not gonna try to stop you from playing your topo. It's like I'm going to notice that you're going to play because like, you kept two energy up. It's like uh, you're probably gonna play a topo, so I'm not gonna overextend. I'm not gonna tap out. I'm just gonna start swinging. You're going to play the topo because if not, you're going to take damage, right? And then just end my turn. And then defend against their total, your board. Then on my turn, try again. You know, that sometimes that's all I gotta do is just wait a turn. So if you violent raise, I wait a turn. Topo, I wait a turn. Flying Nimbus, I wait a turn. And the list goes on. Baby hat check, I wait a turn. Get the idea. The main thing is I always try to assume that my opponent has these types of cards. Because typically I have these types of cards. So I expect my opponent to have these. Floodgate cards, so I'll uh, anticipate. But I'm not going to waste time putting cards in my deck solely for the purpose of trying to counter these cards because that's just a that's just a that's a waste of action, waste of space in the deck. And I don't side deck, so it's, they're not going to be side deck options for me. You know, I main deck what I use, and that's why for me experience is more important than. And cards a lot of times because like like I was saying instead of me playing a card to try to you know, deal with Topo I just get used to playing against it. Oh you played it alright cool in my turn. Or you know what? I got I got ten cards in my hand. You know I could sacrifice two. Yeah I want this attack to go. So I'll swing, I'll pitch two cards. I might want these cards on the drop anyway. Throw a little realm or something. I don't know. Right? It depends on the situation. And just you just go from there. Especially if my attack is, that's the thing. If my attack is going to be my leader swing, like after I get topo, like I probably swing with like a unison or something. And like, oh, you topo? Okay. But my next swing is going to be my leader. I'm going to get to draw. So pitching two cards in my opponent, get one card back. Um, so basically, I just pitch one card to get this attack to go through. Right? So it's not that big of a deal. And, you know, hopefully the, the damage, you know, the damage goes through. 
Because of course, I can always like chomp up the leader's attack, for example, and then bang, I can deal two damage that way. Instead of trying to do damage from the leader swing and a battle card swing, I just get as much damage out of the leader swing as possible. That kind of stuff. So I rather use experience and use what I already have in my deck to deal with stuff, as opposed to like, oh no, I gotta have a card specifically for Topo or for I got to have. I gotta have cards specifically for a specific matchup, blah blah blah. In my, in my, I gotta I gotta have a card specifically to stop opponent from playing food. The Shroud of the Mystery. I know it's banned right now, but when it wasn't banned, I gotta have a card to specifically help me against this. Like uh yeah, you could go that route or you could go the route I prefer, which is to beat your opponent before that even happens, before they can even play that card. Same thing when I turn in times. Instead of me trying to have cards in my deck in case my opponent plays turn ties on me, I'd rather beat them before they do. Or do do everything that I, I need do everything I can to at least set up a couple of blockers on the board and then let turning ties hit the field. Because as long as my opponent can't hit me with his uh, turn ties and leader, maybe a unison swing, I'll survive that turn. Right? So I'm able to turn the tie, right? By making sure I have something in play. And I tend to play a lot of um, Depending on the colors I play, I tend to play uh, blocker unisons, so I'm pretty good against uh, turning tides because I'm gonna have at least a blocker unison in play, right? Or at least a, a deadly defender. That's always a good card to have in play. Um, I play a couple deadly defenders in a couple decks, so the likelihood of you know getting out of you know getting losing to a turning tides is very slim when I I tend to put up you know a couple walls here and there to. Just to protect myself, period. So even if you drop turning times, well, good. We both have no hand, <laughs> but I still have a board. So let's go. Let's play. Right, game on. Um, that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, like soon I'll be posting less and less and less <clears throat> stuff that has to do with Dragon Ball Super because there are other card games I'm interested in trying out. You know, mastering them. Already at close to my final form and mastering this game. You know, the only thing missing, uh, realistically, um, is just you know, dealing the last one damage with no effort. And then that would be my mastered UI. Master Ultra Instinct. Because so far now, I can just, I could be seven with very low effort. Ironically, most of my strategies so far, some of the gameplay, especially with the Cell Zeno, I mean, Cell Zeno, uh, Chain Zeno, uh, combo, among other similar strategies, like turning the ties and stuff like that, um, or the no hand strategy, where they just reduce my opponent's hand size and then swing with a whole bunch of battle cards for game, right? Um, is based off, it, it, I, I'm, I'm like dealing my opponent four, because, you know, the first word is the easiest. Right, and then um, dealing with the last four damage on one turn, as opposed to like doing six to seven damage and then try to deal the last damage late game. So the sooner I can, I'm definitely trying to get to a point where turn four or at the at the latest is the kill turn. You know, like the good old days, as opposed to like trying to do turn five, turn six, or even turn seven kill turns. So that's all I was like. You know, I was having fun with turning the tides, but I was like, hmm, if I can only play turning the tides, you know, one or two turns earlier, you know, it makes a huge, it would make a huge difference, be more powerful. And I was like, well, ironically, chain attack trunk Zeno combo, even though it doesn't have deflect, obviously it's a weakness, though it doesn't have deflect, it has the potential to essentially be a turn four, maybe a turn three under the right conditions, right? I mean, extra extra potential um, on turn two if you, if you can pull it off right um, turn two but turn three more ideally turn three um, a turn three chain Zeno strategy because you know it's not that hard for me to go off and do at least four four plus damage turn one so that way all I have to do is just get you know do like a topo or or a topo or a she answered them to that on turn two, just in case my opponent's trying to, you know, hit me back on the clapback 
I can at least stall long enough to survive, right, to get to turn three, if need be, and then, you know, drop chain, attack trunks, and Zeno, turn three, if I have the, the cards to do so, and then bang, overwhelm, do all the shenanigans stuff, right, and just, boom, finish my point off, turn three, so it'd be like, turn three, kill me. Um, you know, at the earliest. Obviously, I, I can just, you know, typically do a turn four kill just by just playing chain attacks just before, right? But like I said, it's not that hard to do the first, at least the first four damage is easy, so all to do is really do four damage, right? At most. But this is where, you know, com coming up with combos and you know, certain uh, concepts and lines of plays and try to get certain things to work. And the fact that I'm just going back and revisit some old combos, like some old card card interactions. But yeah, play this card with this card and this card and this card and get all this you know amazing capabilities that most decks nowadays don't even have. And a lot of these strategies are generic so they can be splashed as engines in any deck, so so these cards are just good in general by themselves or in combination they do amazing things, right? And just go that route. And again, like I said, just trying to make the 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 game easier and easier. Um, so that way I can consistently do eight damage and then that's it, right? It's just a matter of playing the game after that. Once you get you know, once you get used to certain developing your play style, fighting style, however you get to mastery, master your, your, just, we, we typically we just call it play style. Once you master your play style, because your play style is not what you're playing, it's how you play. Whether you play aggro, right, you play aggressively, fast, uh, play some cards that just make things faster. Because to me, just even just putting a whole bunch of like, uh, like putting Isapine Kai and Chompas in my decks, just makes the deck automatically aggro, regardless of if it's a black deck, green deck, yellow deck, whatever. I can make Hatchiac aggro, which, <laughs> ironically enough, I have my Hatchiac deck right here in front of me, you know, toying with. Um, and I, you know, it's it's uh, my Gogeta, you know, aggro deck. So, so I have a Hatchiac aggro deck. So I'm gonna use that competitively. Because most hatchets tend to not be uh, very aggro, but my build is. And like I said, it's just as simple as just throwing in the chomp of these three guys. So that way, I can just take any anything that I can play a one drop unison, turn turn two, and then use the extra energy to chomp up the unison and bang, double strike my opponent. I could. Get like I could be swinging with like a 25k, even a 30k if I combo right. 30k, you know, double strike on turn two. I probably did, did at least one, it's one damage turn one. So that's already three damage in the first two turns, right? And like I said, the first four damage is the easiest. So I could probably double strike again on turn three. So that'd be five damage. So only if I have three life left. And it's just a matter of dealing the last three damage. And I got some pretty good cards obviously that can attack multiple times. Of course once my leader is awakened, I can start applying pressure with leader. I got board wiping capabilities, I got the you know the Gogeta burn effect. Where once I play it for five energy. So if I stall to turn five I could just play it and burn my one for one and game him out. That kind of stuff. Let's see. Um, but yeah, you know, that's the, the current journey in the Dragon Ball Super community. You know, I've been playing the other card games in, in the beat at the same, you know, while you know, doing Dragon Ball Super, of course. Um, but, uh, like Magic, very little Yu Gi Oh! Very little Yu Gi Oh! I've been doing Yu Gi Oh! for many years. It's my, you know, it's one of my first games. 
technically magic because I play magic. I watched an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Went and, and after it, I was like, okay, I want to play a card game that's the monsters fighting. And I remember my friend trying to sh you know, show me about magic. I wasn't interested in it at that time. But once I saw Yu-Gi-Oh! I was like, yeah, I, I need to play a card game. <laughs> so I went and learned to play uh, magic. So I started off with magic, but Yu-Gi-Oh! was the reason I started playing magic. Then, and I'm still playing card games. Among many other things, I play video games. I haven't played video games in a long, long time, but I play video games and you know, stuff. I, I just like doing things that require, you know, mastery. Because to me, you know, it's it's skills. You know, I learn a lot of different things. I master a lot of different stuff, even martial arts. So there's a lot of stuff that I, you know, get myself, you know, I get into. And right now, you know, I'm at very close to the end of my Dragon Ball Super journey. Masteries, training, whatever you call it. So I'm running out of, you know, things to master because, you know, it's not much left other than consistently doing 8 damage, which is all you ever really need to do as a player is, you know, win. The only thing after that would just be playing for fun, not playing to win because, you know, you already mastered winning, so winning is no longer the goal, the option. Goal. And I've been like that, especially Yu-Gi-Oh! I've, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic, well, most of the card games I played before, you know, Dragon Ball Super, um, I mastered them and I got to the point where it's like, yeah, the game is fun, it's fun to play it, but that's all it is. I'm just playing it, right? I'm not trying to no longer trying to get good at the game because I already got there, right? I already got to the, to the top, right? I already reached my final form in those games. It's more of just a matter of just flexing, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I'll play. Yeah, I beat you. No surprise. Yeah, because I got I got to that point. So there's there's not there's there's no point in just trying to flex for you know for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> that, that I'm good at a, a children's card game, as they say in Yu-Gi-Oh. So obviously I want to. I want to challenge, right? I want, I want to do something new. So it's like, all right, let me play a, a new game and learn the rules and master that, you know, and just keep on going. So that's what I do. Master card games left and right. Um, like I said, the only real thing essentially left in most of the card games would be to play competitively, right? I mean, I master the art of winning. I master the, the basics of, of the games. I created advanced concepts. Ironically, most people might not know, but I wrote three ebooks about Yu Gi Oh! You know, the first one was How to Get Good, the second one was Next Level Yu Gi Oh! and the last one was Master Level Yu Gi Oh! So, I literally wrote books about, <laughs> you know, winning and being good at uh, Yu Gi Oh! So, that's a thing. That most people can't say they've done. Some people can. There are some other people in the Yu-Gi-Oh community that has written books, uh, but not many people can say that. Um, even I was thinking, like, oh yeah, I, I might, you know, still do it. Um, a Yu-Gi-Oh, I'm not a Yu -Oh, a Dragon Ball Super uh, book, um, you know, to put all my stuff. Basically, just taking a whole bunch of the masterclass videos, like all the a lot of the teachings in there, and just basically put it into a book among any other. Stuff, maybe even some stuff I said in some podcasts, um, like this podcast, for example, right? And just um, put it there and just like organize and put it in a, in a format in which it'd be easier for people to, you know, look through, skim through, memorize and stuff. Um, ironically, I've had some friends read my Yu Gi Oh books and they improved and got better um, at the game. But the irony is, is that they themselves are their weakness. They themselves hold themselves back. Like, they read my books, they got better at the game, but then they just stopped doing the things that they learned and just start being who they normally are and play the way they normally play. And they end up losing again. So, hey, you got better. <laughs> you know, you got good, but then you decide you just want to go backwards, just do things your way, and your way wasn't working. That's why you were losing to me before. My way clearly 
gets results. But okay, whatever. You know, as long as you're having fun losing, <laughs> but as long as you're having fun, all right, T still. I'm not. I'm not gonna judge. Right? It's just that I'm gonna notice. I'm like, eh, you could be good, right? You could be a better player, but you keep choosing to not be better. Okay, T still. I can't make somebody do something they don't want to do, right? If you want to be better, then you'll you'll be better by you know putting in the effort, right? You'll try to get as much information and knowledge you can from where from wherever you can get that knowledge from, including me or anyone else, right? You'll try to get better that way. Through other people's uh, knowledge and expertise. I consider myself an expert, right? Expert, master, whatever you want to call it. And sharing knowledge, which is why I make videos to share these things, share these ideas, share from my experience. I tend to be a, a fast learner, so I learn really quick from a lot of my mistakes. And I'm human, I make mistakes, <laughs> but I learn from them, improve them, I get better, you know. And whenever I get better and improve, then I share that with everybody else, right? Through the videos. So that way, <clears throat> A, you can avoid making the same mistakes and, you know, be better before you make the mistake and learn. So that way you don't have to learn the, what I've learned the hard way, right? I learned it the hard way. You don't have to because you can just learn uh, from me uh, the better way of dealing with certain things, right? You can play however way you want. I'm not trying to tell you how to play. I'm just letting you know that there are other ways to play, and I do have my play style. It comes from experience. It's not just shit I'm making up, <laughs> right? Some people probably think that, but it's like, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm not perfect, but I know what I'm doing. You know. Uh, but yeah, definitely looking forward to making other stuff. Just this is long. <laughs> This is me talking for a long time just to say that, yeah, I'm going to be probably posting a lot less in the near future. Um, about Dragon Ball Super, not, not about card games. I was going to be posting about, you know, about card games, among many other things that I do. Obviously, One Piece is a, is a thing. Definitely interested in trying to check out uh, My Hero Academia because, you know, I do like the anime and the certain characters that I like to. Build decks with, so I'm gonna check them out. That way I can at least say, that way at least I can have some stuff and be like, yeah, I'll play the game, you know, or they will do this and that. The funny thing is, I, I got into Digimon, right? But, <laughs> some people might not believe, but I mastered that game way too quickly. It's like, okay, this. And mainly it's because I don't like the way the game plays out, the, the way they expect you to play. It's like, yeah, I don't like that. I'd rather play it my way, and my way just got me from point A to point B, which ironically has quickly influenced that, that community, and they adopted a lot of my uh, ideas and strategies. Ironically, those ideas and strategies actually come from another card game that I used to play called Duel Masters. And since uh, Digimon has a security area, or security triggers, Doom Masters had shield triggers. So, pretty much similar process. Deal, uh, you know, keep attacking the security area, right? Until there's no more security and then attack directly for game. Doom Masters was the same concept. But <clears throat> it had the energy system that uh, Dragon Ball Super has where every card, flip it upside down, you could put it into energy area, or they call it mana. And now you can use it to pay for stuff. So, but there was, you know, back to the shield trigger thing, which is a lot like the security thing, is whenever a card that has the, the shield trigger, um, you can play the card. And there was and there was battle cards, um, or you know, creatures, right? Those creatures that you can play um, for free from, your, you know, because of the trigger effect, and. Once, definitely once they added that into a, a Digimon, where they gave us a security Digimon, as we call it, you know, and then they finally get, and then they gave us like two blockers, they gave us like two blockers, 
I know one was a black blocker. I, think, I don't know. I think there was a, maybe another black blocker. Um, and that was awesome. So mainly I just do security rush uh, as well as the, what's that thing? The life? I think it's, I don't forget what it's called. It's, it's some type of, uh, it's not rejuvenate. It's some type of keyword that has to do with, uh, is it restore? Something like that, where you just take the top part of your life and put it into your uh, security area, basically life gain. And that's what we use. I would use life gain cards. And then every time I want to hit my uh, security area, I would end up playing uh, you know, either a free free play. I either play for free a security digital or play a extra card, right? uh, whatever they call them. Options, they call them option cards. Bang, play an option card for free. So basically I'm playing a lot of stuff for free from my energy area. I mean, from my life area or security area, whatever you call it. In Digimon, I mean, in Doom Masters, we had the same concept. So pretty much I just took one of my old decks from Doom Masters, the concept of it, and just transferred it over to Digimon and bang, there you go. And, I, you know, and then right, you know, right now people are still playing it. And they're playing some other variants, but you know, people are playing, you know, playing security rush as they like to call it. I call it that too, security rush. So, yeah, I have a bit of an influence over there. <laughs> um, but then, you know, like I said, it's like I just, you know. I, or he took my experience from one game and transferred it over to the other one, so it just made it much easier to uh, master it. Same goes for like Dragon Ball Super, you know, taking my experience from playing Magic and Duel Masters, sure. But, um, very similar. Um, even Force of Will. Obviously, Force of Will, it's Magic, but without the uh, lands being in the deck, it's outside of the deck. And, um, now we have what's called, um, and Force of Will has a leader, they call it J Ruler. Ruler. I mean, Awakens J Activate. So, pretty much it's, you know, a leader part, right? Just like DBS. So, a lot of these games that I play, and I play a lot of card games, um, a lot of the same stuff, a lot of the same mechanics, a lot of the same types of effects and, you know, concepts. And I'm able to just take all that knowledge and experience and just easily transfer over to whatever game I play and easily, you know, start mastering it. It's not that different from learning one fighting style and then trying another fighting style and picking up things here and there. And then when you try to learn another fighting style, it'd just be easier to pick up the other fighting style. It's not that different from learning language. You learn how to speak one language. You know, it wouldn't be that hard to learn another language because you use the same type of concept of learning to learn the other language and keep on. So it's just about taking what you know and then applying it to the new thing you're trying to do. And that's what I do with card games. That's why it was so ironic, or so funny to me anyway, that when I got into the game, you know, uh, you know, immediately I'm seeing, you know, a lot of card combinations, a lot of potential. I'm like, oh, yeah, I could, I could do this and that, and I'm able to bring in a whole bunch of different uh, strategies from other card games into this game, and then you know, I start posting, you know, obviously deck profiles and combo videos and stuff like that, and just sharing the information. But ironically, I'm actually getting some ridicule from some people um, for it. You know, telling me that I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm talking about, the decks are terrible, I'm a bad player, blah, 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 all this, you know, stuff. And it's like, okay, it's a little weird. I think y'all would be able to understand what I'm sharing. I think y'all would even put in the effort of going like on untap or even proxy in the cards and try out the ideas before you dismiss it. You know, so I'm from I'm from a time of card game of the card game arrows where that was a thing. People tried things before they had an opinion about something. They didn't just look at a deck list and automatically be like, Oh, this is a terrible deck, this can't win a tournament, blah 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 blah, all these opinions and not even try out the deck. It's like uh give it a try. Try it first. Prove to me that it's not good. 
instead of thinking that it's not good because opinions don't matter. Facts do. There's only proof. But of course, one of the f common things nowadays is is to ask is to ask me for proof, so that way they don't have to do shit. So, even though they're the ones making the accusation, they're the ones claiming that my decks ain't good. And instead of proving it to me, right, proving it, because they're the ones saying that it ain't good, so you would think they would have expertise and they would know what they're talking about, so they should be able to prove it. Instead of them proving it, they want me to prove it. The irony, even after I prove it, they don't seem to care. Right? It's like, okay. So that seemed like a waste of my time. So, so I, 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 I still believe in the idea of like showing proof. Like if I'm talking about a certain concept or idea or strategy, I definitely want to show it in action, of course. You know, when I have the time, I definitely want to show it in action because I want people to be able to see what I'm talking about. I know most people are visual learners, I understand. But most people who say stuff to me tend to be trolls anyway. They just want to say something just for the sake of saying it. Not because there's any legitimacy behind it. Um, yeah. I definitely going to be doing more gameplays. That's something I'm looking forward to. Being able to sit down and play some games for a while. Because, of course, you know, I want to get to my final form, so I got to get a little bit more gameplay under my belt. Let's see. If we can't wait to try out this new hatch here, build this aggro variant. Especially, I got a lot of cool cards in it to try out. Let's see. How about the channel of Dragon Ball Super? Well, I guess I'll point out the fact that I am trying to go to a to the Philly Regionals. That's a thing. Um, I already paid the thirty dollar entry fee. Was it thirty or thirty five? I can't remember. But I still need to get a badge for the convention center, and then I still need to I have a route to get there, but prefer to go there with my teammate, and I would prefer to go in his car because it'd be a forty minute ride to the to the event um, but I'm not. It depends. We still have some time this week for him to this, you know, to decide if he wants to go. Or you let him know about it. It's up to him to decide if he wants to go or not. If he wants to go, then that's great. Then I have a ride. <laughs> if he doesn't want to go, it's like, uh, that's not great. Because <laughs> now i got to take public transportation there. And apparently it's, a, it's, it's, it's about a two-hour ride to the event. I get off of work at 7 a.m. in the morning. So, uh, it's about less than a, I don't know, it's, actually, it's close to a two hour ride just for me to get, um, just for me to get home. So, so, that'd be a total of four hours. And that's just to get home, that's not even including me getting ready, shower and stuff. Getting stuff, and getting food, and everything. let's say that takes me an hour. So then that'd be a total of five hours. And that's if I catch the, uh, you know, my bus at seven, which is not likely. I tend to catch the bus around eight. I mean, I might get lucky, might catch a bus at seven thirty if I catch a different bus, but that's the earliest I could I could catch a bus at seven thirty. So. Add five hours to seven thirty. That's what twelve thirty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, thirty minutes late. You know to the uh, to the event. So that doesn't that doesn't help me. But we'll see. 
the idea ultimately is if is at least to try to go to the event and just at least be there. Even if I don't get to play, which will suck, because think about it, actually going through the trouble to get there and then I can't play the game. Right? I can't play at the event. That'll suck. I have a hatch yet that's ready to roll, right? But I still, you know, go through the process of trying to get it, trying to make sure I'm, re uh, you know, register and all that good stuff to play. And hopefully I get there, time to play. Or if I get lucky and they'll be like, all right, you get round one loss, all right, I'll take it. It's better than nothing. <laughs> At least I get to, you know, stay, you know, play at the event. I don't want to be there just to be there. Um, I would like to play at the event. Of course, meet some people in the stand there. I heard a lot of people want to be there. You know, a lot of people that know who I am, right, and vice versa. So, see how that all works out. So, it'd be awesome. Like, it'd be a really awesome trip. If anything, I mean, if we take the whole competitive aspect out of it, just, just being there. Having to see people, you know, in real life, right, in person, and them seeing me in person, especially if they known about me for the past, you know, four or five years, it's like, oh God, I finally saw you for the first time in real life, five years. It's like, yep, <laughs> I'm real. That was a that was a funny thing at one time. Some people like thought that I wasn't real or something person or something like that. It's like, okay. I don't know how y'all got that idea. I am real. Who is this? A human being. That's a robot. Alright. Um, what other stuff? Stuff. Well, this is going long enough and that'll be the end of the podcast.